Yeah, okay. Well, no problem. Your eyes start to shake and you kind of start to eat. Oh, okay. Yeah, you do. The eye vibrating eyes. It's like looking at, uh, you know, one of those magic picture things where if you cross your eyes, the picture pops out. All right. So, as we've talked, a string is a sequence of characters between quotes. It doesn't matter whether it's single quotes or double quotes. By the way, if you take Java or C, C++, whatever, it does matter. You have to put double quotes around strings. Anyways, and they are ordered by their index value, also called their subscript. So when we say letter is equal to fruit one, that means that one, because we start counting at zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So this just shows a zero-based indexing, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now remember that if you call the length function, it's going to tell you that it's 6 long. That doesn't mean you can use index subscript 6, right? Because that's 1 past the end. Because if you count it out, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we've exceeded 6 by the time we get past 5. So the way you think of it, and if we want to talk about it like a computer scientist, is that the subscripts can range from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the length. Just keep in mind that n minus 1. So, you know, if the length of the string or the length of the list is 10 items, you can go 0 to 9. And you've kind of seen that before with the range, right? If you did range of 1, 9, it actually counts 1 to 8. Or if you just do range parentheses 10, it'll count 0 up to 9. So you can get the length of a string like that. Usually you either store it in a variable or use it in an if for a while or something like that, right? You know, so x is equal to len fruit. At that point, it's going to be 6. x will equal 6. If you try to access the element 6, just like I said, you'll get an error. And unless you have a try accept block in there, that would uh, stop the execution of your program. So it's kind of important to make sure you don't go out of range. And if you do length minus 1, that would get you the last character. But I think I mentioned there's a shortcut for doing length minus 1, and that's just saying minus 1. If you specify minus 1, it goes to the end. And minus 2 is 1 back from the end. And minus 3 is 2 back from the end, and so on. And this is the only language I know that does that. But if you want to get that letter out, just use index negative 1. You want to get that one? Negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5 negative 6 and pass that, it would blow up. Just like if you went past 5 going the other way, it would blow up. Bite. So x subscript 0 is f, f subscript 4 is the t, because that's the last, it's n minus 1 in terms of length. And then x sub 5 is a crash, a runtime error. And then x negative 1 takes you to the end. And so that's also a t. And then x negative 2 is 1 back from the end, and so on. Can I type? Sure, I can. Oh, no, I can't. There we go. Like that, and so on. They have to be integers, obviously. You can traverse through a string with a loop. A while loop, you just use an index counter. And you count your index from 0 up to length minus 1. And you don't have to do that minus 1 business if you're not doing less than or equal to. If you just Train yourself to always use less than when iterating through a list or a string, rather than less than or equal to. You don't have to manipulate the last item in order to get it. But there's another way you could do it. I would use a for loop, honestly, rather than this. So if you're going to iterate through a list, yeah, you could use a while loop, but we've already said that for loops are way more awesome. So I'm not going to even talk about that that much, because if we did it like this, for i in range, or heck, we'll... Uh, use their variable name. For i in range, length, fruit, perfect. We're already all good to go. Letter is equal to fruit at index 
and then print that letter out. Like that. So, I wouldn't use a while loop to step through a string unless I just had to. Similarly, I wouldn't use a while loop to go through a list unless I just had to. Absolutely, to go through a string, that's how I would do it. Right? Because it automatically sets up your index counter. You don't have to initialize your index counter to zero. You don't have to write an expression like that. You don't have to remember whether it's going to be less than or less than or equal to, whether you need to subtract one from the length or not. Boom, it's that easy. So, strongly recommend that if you're asked to iterate through a string, you do it that way. Well, why would you want to iterate through a string? Well, what if you wanted to count the number of, say, periods in a string? I don't know why. The number of spaces. That sounds a little bit more sensible. Well, let's do that. We can do that in idle real easily. Let's see if we can set that up as an example. So as far as I remember, this is uh, L, lecture L. All right, so I'm going to ask the user for some input. No, I'm not, because every time we run it, we have to type something that gets annoying, right? So, you know, I love Python more than I love ice cream. All right. We want to find out how many spaces are in that. And yeah, there are other ways, but what we're going to use is we're going to use a for loop to rip through it from beginning to end, just like I showed you, but we're going to need to be incrementing a counter each time we find a space. So, I think I'll just call it counter. How many, or I could call it spaces found, right? And I could give it any variable name I wanted to. How about spaces, right? That's pretty good. And then for index in range of the length of S, the letter is equal to S at subscript index. And then let's check it. So we're going to do if letter equal equal space, then add one to spaces. Now when I say space, I mean a quote followed by the space bar followed by a quote, not the word space. So if the letter equal equal quote space end quote, then add one to spaces. Spaces plus equals one. Like that. And then we can print a message out. Spaces found equals end quote comma spaces. Like that. Later on, we're going to write a password validator. And you may have done this in one of your other programming languages. You may have done this in fundamentals, where we go through the string checking, do we have enough uppercase letters in this? Do we have enough lowercase letters in this? Do we have uh, you know, any punctuation in it? Do we have any digits? All those kind of rules that people tend to make up for passwords. Another thing we could do is what's known as Caesar cipher. Caesar cipher is where you say, I'm going to shift all the letters in my sentence, either like up by two or down by two, so that every A becomes a C, and every B becomes a D, and every C becomes an F, and so on, right? And so then you write all those letters down, and you give that message to somebody, and then they apply the opposite shifting to it, right? They take minus two off each one, and that gives those C's back to A's, and those D's back to B's, and so on. And that's like a, you know, a Greek or a Roman. The term Caesar would make me think that it's a Roman invention so that they could send messages to each other. And if their spies were caught, they might not know how to decrypt it, not having the NSA with, you know, supercomputers to figure it out. I'm going to run this, see if it works. All right, it found eight spaces. I trust that to be correct. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, that's correct. I was thinking about taking that example somewhere else, and I don't think I will. So, here's their exercise. Write a while loop that starts at the last character in the string and works its way backwards to the first character in the string. 
printing each letter on a separate line, except backwards. All right, well, we are going to do that. That kind of makes sense to do a while loop that way. If, if we have a string of length 6, what is the highest value we can, we can get to? 5, right? So we're going to start off at length minus 1. Whatever the length of our string is, we're going to start at minus 1 that string. And we're going to hope that our string isn't empty, right? That would be bad because string length of 0. And then we said negative 1, and it'd be trying to go back to the end. But there's not, that'd probably generate an error. But I think that'll work OK with the, regular, the way that we are going to write our loop. So we're going to start our index equal to the length of the string minus 1. And then while the index is greater than or equal to 0, because we're going all the way back to the beginning, let's get that letter out. And you probably already realize that doing it in two steps like this is unnecessary. I could just do print parentheses s subscript index rather than split it up like that. So then print the letter out that we just found and subtract 1 from index. Index minus equals 1 or index equals index minus 1 if that's how you would rather do it. And although they ask for us to print it one letter per line, I think it would be cool if we printed it all on one same line. But we'd have to use a little trick that we haven't seen in the classroom lectures yet, which is that you can modify the behavior of the print statement. And what do I mean by that? I'm just going to show you up at the very top. If I do print hello, comma, end equals double quotes like that, and then I print something else, goodbye, it's going to print it all on one line rather than on two lines. If I scroll back up, right? Hello, goodbye. Didn't put a space between them, so I'd have to take care that that worked. I could probably fix that just by putting a, a space there. But I'm smart enough to know now that I need to put that space there. So what is this doing? Well, it's what normally it would be a backslash in there. Or by default, that is what that, per, that argument is. The parameter gets filled in automatically with a default parameter backslash in. So whatever it prints, it puts a backslash in. That's a new line, so it goes to the next line. So every print statement goes to the next line. But we can tell it to do something else. Like what if I put something silly in here, like Fred? All right, then it's going to print, uh, whoopsie, hello, Fred, goodbye. Right, it didn't go to the end because this doesn't say in. This doesn't have a backslash in, in it. If I really wanted to, I could put a backslash in there, and then it's going to say, hello, Fred, and go to the next line. But if I was going to do that, I'd probably do it some other way. Oh, well, what do you know? It didn't. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, there it went. OK. So by using end equals quote, quote, I stop it from going to the next line. Why do I care? So that I can print each letter out without going to the next line. And then finally, I'll, I'll use another print statement, you know, the equivalent of hitting the return key after we're done typing. So I'm going to put a comment here that end equals dot dot that, you know, quote, quote, means don't go to the next line. So where I'm printing it out inside my while loop, I'm going to add an end parameter. End equals quote, quote. And then after the while loop is done, then I need to hit return, right? You know, then I just need to print a normal, you know, end of, you know, effectively sending a, a backslash end to it so it'll go to the next line. There we go, and that's backwards. I love Python more than I love ice cream. I can think of other ways of doing this. I could probably take advantage of that negative one business and go all the way out to the, eh, you know, this is good enough. 
Hopefully that's clear. There are times when my brain thinks that a for loop is better, like that, and there are times when my brain works like a while loop. And we could write this while loop as a for loop instead. And my brain doesn't lend itself towards doing that, but I would do for index in range, and my starting point would be length s minus 1. See, this is going to look kind of ugly. My ending point is going to be negative 1, which sounds weird, right? But we got to go past 0. And if you're going downwards, you got to make your number 1 less than the farthest value. Just like when you're using a range upwards, you've got to go 1 greater. And what is our step? It's also negative 1. So this looks crazy, right? And then we can print it out, right? Print. Whatever. I'm not going to even do anything with it. We, we, we know that it will work. Maybe, maybe we don't. I wonder if I'm going to get a syntax there. Yeah, okay. So that worked. I guess it would not take long to copy this print statement and paste it here and have it do the same thing. And then put another print underneath here to get it to go the next line. All right. I don't really like the looks of that. That looks a bit goofy. Hopefully you've seen the range statement counting down enough that you kind of recognize what it's doing, right? Like if you're going to count down from, from 10 to 5, that would be 10. And this would be 4 because it's got to be one past your limit. And that would be minus 1 to make it count down rather than count up. Same business here. I'm not going to mess with that any further. That's how my brain works. If this if this clicked, great. If it didn't, if you ever have to do it, just do it that way. So you can use a for loop. You could do it even more quickly than how I was doing it with that index counter, right? I did for index, in range, len, fruit, right? Or you can just do for character and fruit, and that will put in that variable every letter that's in that variable. We could do that. Let's let's go ahead and do that. Maybe we'll do it right here. So for character in S, print that character out. Except I'm going to call it letter, right? Because we call it a letter everywhere else. But it not is it really a letter? If it's a period or a question mark or something like that, no, it's it's not. But that's what I was using up there and above. So just to make my variables consistent, I'm going to go ahead and do it that way. But I'm going to do the comma int equals quote quote business. And then I'm going to print. Call print by itself so it'll go to the next line after it's done printing it. Seems to be working. Of the two, would I rather do it like this? I'm just going to copy this thing that was counting the number of spaces. I'm going to copy it. I don't care if you do this or not. But if I copy that, took the business about the if statement out, and changed that to a print. OK, it wound, it wound up being a lot more than I thought. And then index plus equals 1 and then printing a final character turn. Anyways, these loops do exactly the same thing right here. But one of them is a lot easier to write than the other, isn't it? And to make sure I don't have a syntax here, I'm going to run it. So the way I think about loops is that if I can possibly use a for loop, I will unless it kind of hurts my brain. This kind of hurt my brain, so I probably wouldn't do it that way. But for printing out every letter, that's great. Doing it as a while loop would take more. Oh, I did this wrong. I don't know if anybody will spot what's wrong. I guess I'll just highlight the line that's wrong. Why is that wrong? 
Well, we're supposed to be adding one in a loop, right? Well, do our for loops really need an update to the variable? No. No, they don't, right? That would probably make it skip, you know, like from 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. In fact, I'm going to run it and see what it looks like. No, it manages to work miraculously. In other languages like C++ or Java, it would not. If you have a for loop, you don't need to update your index. And it's still going to work. All right. So we've seen several different loops for going through a string. Just kind of memorize one and go with it. Or, you know, I'm not sure if on the and the excuse me. I'm not sure if on the exam I ask. Probably be on the second exam anyways, by, by which time you'll be grandmasters at it. Whether you're going to, you know, either use a for loop to print through a string or use a while loop. Nah, I'm probably not gonna ask those. Lists, maybe, but I would look at the exam and give y'all a warning if that's going to be it. Just, just learn some way of stepping through a loop. I would want you to learn both the way to do it with some kind of while loop, whether it's a while loop or a for loop like that, and also this way. So a lot of times you can use a range. So I'm going to call that a for range loop. I call this one a for value loop because we're stepping through values. Now, I called my variable letter there, but I could have called my, my variable value there. So I'm going to make a little note of that here in my notes over here. Three quotes to start my big comment. For i in range 10, your prof calls that a for range loop. And then for v in whatever, like a string, a list, or whatever, your prof calls that a for value loop. Then I better end my comment with a couple more quotes. Anybody need typo help? Yep. Oh, sure, sure. But I'm going to change this one back to what it was. So if you were getting stuck on me making that change and then I scroll too quickly, I'm going to undo it. So what you need. So string slices. We talked about that. A slice specifies the beginning point and one past the end point, just like the range. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if we say 0, colon 5, it's going to get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so by the time we print this out, it's going to print mine. And then this one started at 6. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's going to start at that one. And it's going to go out to 12. Well, I could kind of guess that it's going to get the rest of the string. But we can figure it out. If that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 1 past 11 is 12, so that's great. Now, if we put 13 there, it would generate an error because it went past the end of the string. If you want, you can leave off that number, and it means go to the end. 
So I'm going to go back to that I love ice cream business. And I want it to start there and go to the end. So I just need to figure out what index that is. And I'm going to do a real primitive. 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 31. So I'm going to start it at 31. And I could go out to the length of it, but I could also just put colon, colon and go to the end. So let's prove that both of those work. So I'm going to come down here and make two strings. S1 is equal to S. What number did I say that was? 31 colon like that. And an S2 was going to be S starting at 31. Can I type? And going to the end of the string, which would be length of S, but with a square brace there at the end. I'm going to put some extra spaces that I don't expect you to do, just to try to make it easier to read. Now, I really don't remember whether 31 was the beginning of the word ice. My, my brain flipped while I was counting it out. Well, I didn't print them out at all. Okay, but I can check. Print S1. Yeah, I, I barely managed to remember it. Okay, so print S1, comma S2. I'll print those two values out, and it'll say ice cream both times. If I wanted to start at a specific position and go to the end of the string, I would use this syntax because it's block quicker to type, right? If you leave off the number at the beginning, it starts at position zero. And if you leave off the entire, if you leave off everything except for the colon, it goes from the beginning, it goes to the end, but it makes what's known as a clone of the data. Well, let's play with that. Let's make string S3 equal to S0 colon 31, and S4 is equal to S. I'm going to leave off the first number in front of the colon, and I'm still going to go out to 31. Then I'm going to print those two things out as well. Print S3 comma S4. So S3 and S4 should be the same exact thing. Yeah, I love Python more than I love. I love Python more than I love. All right, the idea of having to sit there and manually count, you know, like that to find the beginning of the word ice cream is dumb. There ought to be a way to search that string to find the position of the word ice cream in it. And there is a way. There's a way you can search the string for the position of something else. And since my brain just slipped on it, I'm not going to mention it until I find it again in here. So, strings are immutable. That means they cannot be changed. What does that mean? It means that I can't change the first letter of this string to something else. I can't say, you know where it says I? Maybe I want to change it to a capital U so that it'll print you love ice cream or you love Python more than, oh, come on. That, the keyboard is, eh, won't blame it on the keyboard, it's my fault. Anyways, you would think if you knew something about the way that things are stored in memory that perhaps that would change the I because it's the first character to a U. But instead it just blows up. It won't let us do that. It'll generate an error. And it says the string object does not support item assignment, meaning we can't assign a value into a specific position in the string. Because this string, once created, is immutable. Now there are other things I could do if I wanted to make a string that said you love Python more than I love Python. You know, so if that's going to give me an error, then I could try to do it like this, and there might be other ways, but this is just the first thing that occurs to me. You know, S is equal to, you know, U, 
or maybe even the whole word, quote, you, quote, plus the entire string starting from position one all the way to the end, like that. And then if we print S out, it should say you love ice cream. You love Python more than ice cream. So I hope this kind of makes sense. Here we use slicing to make a string that starts from the second character and goes all the way to the end, because it starts at index position one, which is the second character, but before we tacked on a U. Like that. You love Python more than I love ice cream. Now, are there other ways of doing that? Yeah, probably so. There is something called replace, where you could probably replace all the capital I's with capital U's. But if some other word began with a capital I, like India, you know, India is a nation, capital I, proper noun, well, it would change those as well. That wouldn't be as cool. So here's what they showed. They have hello world, but they want to make a new greeting and they want the first letter of it to be a J rather than an H. So they say new greeting is J plus greeting and then they use slicing to get hello world. So when it prints it out, it says jello world. So looping and counting, we did this with the spaces. Now here we're just showing we're trying to figure out how many A's there are. For every letter in the word, if that letter is an A, add one to our counter. And since the for loop takes care of everything, we don't need to mess with indexing or anything like that. All right, so exercise. Encapsulate this code in a function named count and generalize it so that it accepts the string and the letter as arguments. Well, we can do that. That won't be a problem. It's just that this is going to need to be a variable name rather than a letter because we don't always want to search for A. We want to search for whatever character is being passed to it as an argument. So it's going to look something like this. Say the character we're searching for is a lowercase a. Then we could do something this. For every, for letter in S colon, if letter is equal equal to our care colon, then count plus equals one. And then after all that stuff, we would want to return the count. Now, this is a syntax error because I haven't defined it as a function yet. So I'm going to have to put a DEF above it, and I'm going to have to tab everything below it. So, DEF count letter, that's a good enough name for me, and I'm going to make it have two parameters. They're going to pass in the string, and they're going to pass in the character to search for. Well, if they're passing in a character to search for, we don't need to redefine it to A. So I think that line needs to go. And then the next three need to be indented. Like that, like that, and like that. And at the end of the uh, function, we're going to return the count. And that's going to be a syntax error. I wanted somebody to tell me what's wrong with that. There's a serious problem with that code. Right, I never initialize the counter. So maybe there's a count that's uh, been used before. It might pick up that value, but that would be an error. So the first thing in the function needs to be count is equal to zero. And I think we figured out that there were like eight spaces in that string, so let's just call count letter and find out how many spaces are in our string, and it ought to equal the same thing we saw before. X is equal to count letter in our string, or let's, let's pass in a new string, like, I don't know, abracadabra, 
whatever. We're going to figure out how many A's are in that. And then we're going to print it out. Nope, nope, nope. I've made a mistake here. An experienced programmer might spot it. What's wrong is what I did there. I called count letter and I passed it the string that I want to search, but I've done, I've forgotten something. Right, I didn't specify what I was looking for. So I need a second parameter, a second argument, because this one has two parameters. We need two arguments. So let's go ahead and find, I'm going to put apostrophes around it. You could use double quotes. Find an A. And then let's print A's found, well that, that looks weird, A's, A apostrophe S, found equals in quote comma X, something like that. And let's see how many A's there really are, one, two, three, four, five. So when it runs it ought to print five. So I found five A's. Is there a built-in function to count how many occurrences of the letter are in the string? I would bet so. Just like I bet that there's a built-in function that'll you know change all the capital I's to capital U's or something like that. If we go up and look at the string class in the Python notes, we can find some of that stuff out. I'm going to pull up. Come on, get over there. All right. String Python three. Well, that sure is not doing what I was expecting it to do. It's talking about math rather than, than the string class. All right. So string operations. Get value. Convert field, format the string. Still not finding the ones that I really, really, really want. Like to test to see if something is an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter or things like that. So I tell you what I'm going to do is upper python.org. All right, so here are the string functions. Quite a few of them, if I scroll up to the top. They're called methods because a method is a function that's attached to a piece of data. So if we want to capitalize the first letter of the string, we can call, like if we wanted to print out, I love ice cream, but we wanted the first letter capitalized, which it already is, we would do s.capitalize. If you want to pad it out with a whole bunch of spaces around either side so that it was centered, like, you know, how in the old days you had a typewriter and you wanted to center the title of it, you know, and you'd have to tab over or whatever, you could do that. And here we go. Count the number of non-overlapping occurrences of the string inside the other string. So let's do that. X is equal to S dot count. And let's find out how many B's are in it. And me being lazy, I'm going to copy that print statement and just paste it and then change that A's found to B's found. All right. It didn't find any B's. Why would that be? Oh, because I looked in string S rather than in looking in abracadabra and were there any bees in the phrase I love ice cream more than nah there weren't again let's, let's count how many spaces are in it alright 
And so again, it found eight spaces in our string. I love Python uh, more than I love ice cream. Clearly, it's easier to call a built-in function like that, a method of the string class, rather than write our own. So why did we write our own? So you get the concept. Once you've written your own, sure, great. Uh, forever after, just go ahead and use a built-in function. In general, the built-in functions have performance far greater than whatever you could cook up. It's difficult to think that you could come up with a function that would be faster than theirs. And they made theirs a little bit more flexible than ours in that it can check not just for single letters, but you could actually look for you know longer strings inside the other string. Let me look at our output again. I want to see if there's any places where we have duplicates. Right. Well, we have the word uh, love, right? Let's count how many times the word love appears in it. So x is equal to s dot count, parentheses, quote, love, in parentheses. And then just copy our print statement, paste our print statement, and make it say love is found. There ought to be two by my reckoning. Yep, it found two occurrences of that string. When you're talking about a string inside of another string, you can call it a substring. This was the substring that it was looking for. Love is supposed to be a substring of S. And if it didn't find it at all, like if we look for the word hate, then it's going to return a zero. So I'm going to copy this entire bit of code, copy those two lines, and paste them. And I'm going to change love to hate, both there and there. And it ought to say that it didn't find the word hate anywhere in it. All right, so hate's found. All right, so if I'm going to go back to my notes that I was taking, We're going to talk about string functions a little bit. Yeah. X is equal to S dot count, you know, T, which returns the number of times T occurs in string S. I want you to know that. So the in operator looks more like a keyword to me. But anyways, it checks to see if something is in something. If a substring is in the big string, check to see if A is in the string banana. Yeah, sure is. Check to see if the word seed is in banana. Nope, it is not. So we could find out whether the word love is in the string or not. Now, we already know it is. But, you know, let's, found, let's write something and let's call our variable found. Found is equal to, quote, love, in quote, in S. That means search the string S for the current's love. And let's just print it out. Print love found, question mark. Let me bump this up so that the folks in the back of the room can see it a little bit more easily. Love found, question mark, end quote, comma, found. And then just copy those two lines, paste them, and change the word love to hate. Then I better do a walkabout and make sure I'm not leaving people behind. So the IN keyword, or operator as they're calling it, checks to see if this substring is in the, that string. And if it is, it returns true. So when we print it out, it's going to say that love found true. But hate does not occur in that sentence, our I love Python. So when it says hate found, it's going to say false because the IN keyword 
returns false if the substring is not found in the string. Can I think of another way of doing that with the count method? Yeah, I could. I typed all that in my notes rather than uh, in idle. Very clever. Okay. Copy, 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 copy. Paste. All right, so that's where the new stuff started off, right there. All right, and so yes, love was found in the sentence and hate was not found. Could we have done that with the count method? Yeah, we sure could have. If s.count parentheses hate in parentheses is equal to zero, it means it wasn't found. Print hate not found. Like that. But if you have this syntax, if you have this keyword I N. I would use that rather than use the scount function because I'm sure that the keyword is optimized to be a little bit faster than this function. For one thing, I bet this stops the first time it finds it, right? Because if it's searching our, our, our little sentence here, I love Python more than I love whatever, all it has to do is the first time it finds one, it stops. But if it's doing a count, it's got to keep going to the end of the string. And what if the string is like 30,000 characters long? It has to search all 30,000 characters to figure out how many times that word appeared in that string. Whereas the IN keyword would stop as soon as it found the first occurrence of it. But there's always more than one way to do something in programming. And this is just an example of showing. Now what if I wanted to say that hate was found rather than not found? I could put an else clause here or I could use a not. I'm just going to leave that alone now. You get the idea. All right, anybody need typo correction? I need the exercise, so say yes. No? I'm not typing fast enough then. All right, so comparing strings. If word is equal to banana, you say print. OK, bananas. If any of y'all guys are in Java, you know that that's not how you do it in Java. And I'm just going to mention it and delete it for the benefit of, of the poor folks who have me in two classes in a row. If you have that, that won't work. Instead, what you have to do is word.equals banana, like that. All right. Just can't use equal equal to compare strings in that language. But yay, we can in this language. Also, you could want to check to see if a word is less than another word or a word is greater than another word. And the way it does that is just alphabetically. You know, dog with a D is less than giraffe with a G, which is less than zebra with a Z, right? And pig with a P is greater than cow, right? Because it's greater than the, the, you know, the letter. And so it just does a letter by letter comparison trying to alphabetize it. And so here it is. It says pineapple comes before banana. And then you go, wait, what? That's a P. That's a B. Capital P is not less than B. Well, it is according to the good old ASCII table. If we come up here and fire up the ASCII table and we find where the uppercase B is, it's got a value of 66. In, in decimal or 42 in hex. And what was the other letter they were showing us? Banana, B. A lowercase b is a 98. And so clearly a 66 is in fact less, or whatever it was, where's the capital P? An 80 is less. In other words, all the uppercase letters are less than all the lowercase letters. And all the punctuation symbols, except for a couple down here at the very end, are less than either of them. And the punctuations are less than the numbers, and the numbers are less than all the letters. You know, so honestly, I, I never wind up comparing two strings like that to check to see if one is less than the other. But equal equal, yeah, that's real important, right? You want to check to see if somebody typed in no data, their uh, value might be empty, right? They just hit enter without typing something, like this. S is equal to input. 
type something, yo. And then if they hit enter without typing in anything, then S is going to equal quote, quote. There's not going to be any data between the quotes. So if S equals equals, quote, quote, no spaces, print I told you to type something. There's other ways you could check that. You could check the length of it. If the length of S is equal to zero, I told you to type something. And I don't know which of those two ways would be uh, faster. Using uh, the, the len function or just doing a comparison like that. My hunch is that that would be faster than counting because counting has got to go to the end of the string. And if they typed in, you know, the entire book of Genesis or whatever, you know, and it was 10,000, 100,000 letters long, then uh, it would count getting all the way out there before it ever did the comparison. So that's probably a faster way to check to see if the string is empty. Just about time to stop. Getting there anyways. I'm going to go ahead and make the Dropbox so that if somebody has to... And I just did that. It's not what I meant to do. It didn't lose our place. So string methods. I just showed you one method. I showed you dot count. I was trying to remember that keyword, and I couldn't remember it. DIR. If you type DIR and then you pass something in like that, it'll list all the methods that are available to you. Like that turtle object that we used a while. I'm going to go ahead and throw this example in, not that we're playing with turtles today, but I'm going to do import turtle, and then I'm going to do print, parentheses, DIR, parentheses, turtle with a capital T, because that's the name of the object once you import it. That's the name of the class. And it's going to print a whole bunch of stuff because the turtle is a real flexible drawing object. I wonder if it will work. Nah, it didn't. Okay, well, teach me. What if I make a new turtle? T is equal to lowercase turtle dot uppercase turtle. Parentheses in parentheses. That should make the turtle. And then in here, I'm going to do print parentheses, dir parentheses, t, and then two closing parentheses. All right. And that's all the methods that are found in the turtle class. Way more than I wanted to know. But, you know, it's got the forward and the backwards and the left and the right and the change colors and things like that. Everything that we saw. You know, the few times we played with turtle, or if you played with turtles in fundamentals, you'll remember them. So we could do the same thing for string. Print the directory of the string class, or of our string. All the functions that we could, all the methods that we could call in string. We'll see count, but there's a lot of others. I'm getting tired of having to hit enter there. But here they are, a whole bunch of them. Some of them I'll, I'll kind of mention there. There's called is digit. There's one called is numeric. Is upper, is lower. We could find out a lot of information about a string or about a specific letter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say character, and why don't we use a, a for loop, and this really will be close to the last thing we do. We're going to use a for loop to examine our string again, but then we're going to use some of those functions to decide whether that letter is an uppercase or a lowercase or a digit. So for letter in string, I'm going to use a value loop. If letter dot is upper, I 
I guess I should print the letter out before I do that. Print, parentheses, no quotes, even though I started to type one. Letter, comma, quote, uh, letter, comma, end equals two quotes, parentheses. Or maybe I'll make the end a space so that there's a space between what I'm about to write here and the thing that comes before. So if the letter is upper, let's print letter is uppercase. And again, I should be calling it character because if it's a punctuation mark, is it really a letter at all? That annoys me enough that I'm actually going to remove the letter from the print statement. And how about this? If letter dot is lower, parentheses in parentheses colon, print quote, you know what? I could just take off the word is completely. Uppercase, lowercase, how about digit? Let's see if it's a digit. If letter dot is digit, parentheses in parentheses colon, print digit. Now my output's going to be real ugly because these words are going to all overrun each other. The only thing that's going to save me is the fact that if it's uppercase, it's not lowercase, right? And if it's neither uppercase, if it's a digit, it's not going to be in any others. But if I thought that something could be more than one of these, I should be putting spaces after them to so separate them so it doesn't say uppercase, lowercase without any spaces there. All right. I'm getting real tired of this input statement. I'm going to quote that out just so I don't have to keep hitting enter every time I run it. Oh, and it popped up a turtle. I need to comment that stuff out. All right, so a U is uppercase, an L is lowercase. This formatting is really bad. I did something lousy to make it look this way. The O is lowercase, the V, the Python. In fact, it's all lowercase except for the U, where it says, you know, you love Python. So I could go back and I could capitalize P so that I would see more than one, you know. But we kind of got the idea. There's no digits in it. I'm really not liking this output, and I don't know what I did to make it look quite that lousy. I'm going to go and take a peek and see if I can spot it. How about I take that out? And how about I put a space there? And a space there? And a space there? And a space there? And after we're done printing all of that stuff, let's just print a character term like that. I think that'll make it look a little bit better. And I'm going to make a different string. S is equal to I love Python 23 times a year. That's kind of dumb. How about I eat ice cream? But I'm going to capitalize some of these. 23 times a year, exclamation point. I think that'll make my output look a little bit better. I still need to get rid of that turtle. All right. It's still not perfect, but we can see it. I is uppercase, E is lowercase, A, T, and then there's a space, and the space is nothing, but there's a way that you can check to see if if it's a space actually. Maybe we're going to put another if in there to handle that. Let's do that. So here I'm going to do if letter dot now you might think that it's is space that's close but it's actually is white space and let me make sure I have that right. Well, I'm not seeing it real fast, so I'm just going to run it and see if that's if that works. Oh, well, I forgot my colon. Here we go. Expecting an indented block. Oh, I forgot to print something, if that was true. Okay, so print, quote, space, end quote. 
and it blew up probably because there's no attribute white space. Oh, it is called is space. What do you know? I was wrong. All right. So this should have just been is space rather than is white space. The real takeaway is that you can examine a character to find out whether it's uppercase, lowercase, a digit, a space. And as a matter of fact, you can call that on an entire string of characters as well as just one character. If you want to see if the entire word is uppercase, you just call it is upper. If you want to see if the entire string is digits, you call it is digit. And if it finds anything that's not a digit, then it would return false. All right, and there we go. Let's see, we got our spaces here. The only thing that didn't print anything was the punctuation mark. And as far as I know, there's no special function to see if something is a special character like that. We can kind of hack it, though. There's one more called alpha num. Alpha num means alphanumeric. It means it's either a letter or a digit. So I'm going to do this. If not, except in this language, it's the word not. Sorry about that. If not space letter dot is alnum, alnum, parentheses in parentheses colon, print. I guess we ought to also check to see if it's a, a space, but anyways, this will be good enough. Special character. We're counting spaces as special characters, apparently. That'll handle even that last exclamation point. All right, and so it did. There's a space and it's a special character. There's a space and it's a special character. I should have been doing that comma end equals empty quote on all of these rather than just say when we printed the letter out itself. That would make it look a little bit prettier, but that would take some time to add and I'm not going to do it. It's not really worth it. So what if we want to find the position? Do you remember when I was looking for the word ice? in the ice cream and I couldn't, you know, and I had to memorize where it started. Well, I can act, okay, let me get rid of this turtle stuff. I'm really tired of seeing it. I'm going to do control F, find turtle, and just delete those three lines. I'm tired of them. You know, you like them, you want to keep them? Well, I guess I could comment them out. Okay. Yeah, anyways, so we have this new string. I eat ice cream 23 times a year. Let's say I want to find the word ice in it. Well, I just use dot find. X is equal to S dot find, and I'm what am I looking for? I'm looking for the substring quote ice. Quote ice. I cannot type today. Ice. And then print ice found at index in quote comma X. And it found it at position 6. Sounds right. I'd have to scroll back up. For some reason, we never printed the sentence. I guess we could right here. Print S. Make it easy to spot. OK. So I eat ice cream. Well, if I count it out, that's position 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and indeed, that's 6. So if you need to find a specific character or a specific substring, then you use dot .find. What does it return if it doesn't find it? Well, let's find out. Let's make it look for lowercase ice. Why? Because I capitalized mine, so lowercase ice should not be a match. Should not find it in there at all because it is case sensitive. All right, and so it said that ice was found at index negative 1. So if you call dot find and it doesn't find it, then it returns a negative one. That's another way you could check to see if something was inside something else, right? Just like we used if love in S 
You could use dot find love, and if it returned a negative one, you know it's not in there. But again, the IN keyword would be the way to go. And I do think that's about enough. This is a really important chapter. That's why we're kind of spending some time with it. All right, gang, there's a Dropbox. Let me pause the recording, make sure that everybody's got no typos that they want fixed. So the functions we've talked about so far were s.find, s. is space, s. is alnum. I'm kind of just writing this for my own sake. Is and so that you can go and find these in your notes. Is lower, is upper, s. Dot is digit. And it seemed like there was another one up here. Count. And then I'll come back and I'll put a description of what each one of those do. Please memorize those guys.